Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 3 Biology Area of Study 1. Today we are going to be looking at the dot points involving nucleic acids and proteins. So in terms of looking at nucleic acids and proteins, the dot points that we are going to focus on out of the study design are nucleic acids as information molecules that encode instructions for the synthesis of proteins in cells. We're going to be looking at protein diversity and the nature of the proteome. We're going to be also talking about the functional importance of the hierarchical levels of protein structure. Um, we're going to talk about the synthesis of a polypeptide chain from amino acids um, through the process of condensation polymerization. We are also going to be talking about the structure of DNA and the three forms of RNA. And of course, looking at protein synthesis, so the steps of transcription and translation. So let's start off just by discussing the different nucleic acids that we have. So we have DNA and RNA. We know that DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid and we know that RNA is ribonucleic acid. Now these contain all of the information that is going to be required to encode instructions for the synthesis of a protein. Now these proteins, they could be enzymes, they could be antibodies, they could be receptors, they could be channel proteins, they could be hormones. There's lots and lots and lots of different proteins within our body that we need to be able to produce. So we'll just start off by discussing DNA. So DNA um, controls all metabolic processes in the cell. It is the coded instructions. Um, we know that DNA is double-stranded. Um, in terms of the components of DNA, DNA is made up of a deoxyribose sugar, a pentose sugar. We've got a phosphate backbone and we've got the nitrogenous bases, okay? And these bases are A, T, C, G, where adenine binds with thymine and cytosine binds with guanine. In RNA, the difference is that we've got three different types of RNA. We've got mRNA, rRNA and tRNA. And RNA is single-stranded, okay? So in comparison to DNA having two strands, one, two being double-stranded and forming a double helix, RNA just has a single strand. The sugar that RNA has is ribose instead of deoxyribose. It still has a phosphate um, backbone. And the nitrogenous bases, it still has adenine, cytosine, and guanine. But in RNA, the thymine is based with, uh, is swapped with uracil. So in this case, adenine binds with uracil and guanine is still going to bind with cytosine. In terms of looking at our three types of RNA, mRNA is the carrier of the genetic message to the ribosome. So DNA can't exit the nucleus, therefore it is being converted into an mRNA sequence, which is then able to travel to the ribosome for protein synthesis. Our rRNA is what's making up our ribosomes, our ribosomal RNA, and the tRNA is a transfer RNA molecule, which we're going to talk a little bit more about when we discuss translation, but it is basically carrying the amino acids to the ribosomes in order to create our protein. All right, moving on. So, in terms of our genetic instructions. So the genetic instructions are coded by ATCGs and those order of those nucleotides is really important. That's giving us the coding information. So the main features of the genetic code is when we read the genetic code, we read it in threes, in triplets. And a triplet is called a codon. Okay, it codes for a specific amino acid. The code is what we call universal. So it is going to be in the same in animals, it's going to be the same in plants, it's going to be the same in bacteria. The code is also what we call degenerate. So that means that more than one codon can code for an amino acid. So if we look at um, leucine, LEU, LEU can be coded by UUA, UUG, CUU, CUC, CUA, CUG. That means it is un uh, degenerate. Okay, so there are many codons that code for the same amino acid. And if you look at the amino acid chart 
you will notice that. DNA template strand always has a start codon, which is TAC, all right? The mRNA um, start codon is AUG, okay? Because A binds with T, A binds with U, C binds with G. And we've got three stop instructions. So um, they are for our DNA template strand, ATT, ATC, or ACT, and we can find the corresponding mRNA sequence on our amino acids, so UAA, UAG, and UGA. So in terms of looking at the genetic instructions to create a protein, we first off have our DNA, which is our code of ATCGs. We can then convert that into an mRNA strand, okay, which is then going to be taken to the ribosome, um, where our amino acids are now going to be um, put together following that code, okay? So the tRNA molecules are going to bring the amino acids based on that mRNA sequence. And we know that lots of amino acids put together is going to form what we call our polypeptide, which is forming our proteins. All right. So in terms of this process, protein synthesis, we are synthesizing a protein. So it involves two major steps that we are going to look at, that is transcription and translation. So transcription occurs in the nucleus. It is where a portion of DNA is gonna be unzipped and an mRNA strand is going to be created from that DNA template strand. So it's going to be what we call complementary. Creating that mRNA strand, um, that is called pre-mRNA and that has both exons and introns in it. So our exons are our coding regions. They're the ones that are going to code for the particular protein, whereas our introns are our non-coding regions. So before our mRNA can be taken to the ribosome to undergo translation and create the protein, there's a few transcriptional modifications that are going to occur. They are capping, adding a poly A tail and splicing. So capping occurs at the five prime end of our DNA strand. Um, once we've created our mRNA, so it's occurring on the pre-mRNA, where there's an altered guanine nucleotide base um, sequence that is protecting the molecule from enzyme attack. So we call that capping at the five prime end. We also then at our three prime end, add a poly A tail. So we add many, many, many adenine um, bases downstream of the coding region. This is just to stabilize the molecule. We then have our splicing. So you may remember that I mentioned here that that pre-RNA has coding and non-coding regions. So what happens in splicing is the introns are taken out. So the non-coding regions are taken out and they remain in the nucleus and the exons are then um, spliced together using spliceosomes. So the difference between pre-mRNA and mature mRNA is these transcriptional modifications have occurred. So mature mRNA is now able to exit the nucleus through the cytoplasm to go to a ribosome. Okay, so at the ribosome, that's where translation is occurring. So there is an anticodon, so anticodons are going to be complementary to mRNA codons, and they attach the proper amino acid to a specific protein. And this is using our amino acid chart, where each codon is coding for a particular amino acid. So what's happening is our tRNA molecule, okay, is coming to the ribosome where the mRNA strand is, and it has attached to it an anticodon that's going to be complementary to the codon on the mRNA sequence, and attached to the tRNA molecule is an amino acid. So if we look over here, we started off with our DNA, okay? We have undergone transcription, so that's converting our DNA to mRNA, so 
where our C binds with a G, C binds with a G, A now binds with U, T, A, C binds with G, T binds with A, and so on. So basically, um, we've created our mRNA strand. We have undergone these transcriptional modifications. Our mRNA has then gone through the cytoplasm to a ribosome where we have our mRNA sequence and our tRNA that has the anticodon bringing in the amino acids. Those amino acids are then going to join together to form a protein. So in terms of forming that protein, this process is going to stop when a stop codon is reached, which means that protein has now um, been created. All the amino acids required for that protein are now there. All right, so now moving on to how those amino acids are joining together. So this is a process called condensation polymerization. So this is where we have our two amino acid molecules. Okay, so this is one amino acid. This is another amino acid. Now, the important thing about an amino acid is it has a NH2 on this side, so it has an amine group, and it has a CWH, a, carbox a carboxyl group, on the other side. Now, what happens with our two amino acids when they join together, the carboxyl group of one amino acid is going to be attracted to the amine group of another amino acid. And you're going to recognize some of these um, elements here. In particular, you should know H2O. So H2O is two H's and an O. We know that H2O is water. So what's going to happen in this process is H2O is going to be formed. So we've got one molecule of water formed. And this C, O, H, and N are going to form a bond. And we call that bond a peptide bond. So in terms of our amino acids joining together, we will have um, now a peptide bond formed and the water molecule has now left. So if we were to join another amino acid here, we've got this carboxyl group. The amine group of the other amino acid is going to join here and form a peptide bond and so on. They're going to keep going on and on and on. Alrighty, moving on to protein functions. So looking at protein functions, um, we need to be able to identify what a proteome is. Now, a proteome is the complete array of proteins that are produced by a single cell or organism. Um, proteins, if they are given a very high temperature or low pH or very high pH, so extreme pH levels, um, they denature the protein. So the protein can no longer hold its original shape and it's going to lose its ability to carry out its biological functions. I mentioned a couple of um, proteins earlier that are important, but basically roles of proteins are essential. Okay, They all have different roles. Different proteins have different roles. Uh, some are structural, some are catalytic, some are regulatory, some are involved in the immune defense, some are involved in movement, and some are involved in transport. These are roles that you need to be aware of and understand that different proteins have different roles. All right, in terms of the hierarchical structure of a protein, this is also really important. So there are four main structures of proteins that we look at. We have the primary structure. The primary structure is basically looking at the sequence of amino acids. So it is the specific linear sequence of amino acids that is going to determine the protein function. Remember, those um, amino acids are based on a specific DNA code. We then have our secondary structure, which is looking at amino acid chains folding in three ways. So they can be either alpha helix shaped, they can be beta pleated, or they can be random coiling. We then have tertiary structure of proteins, which are further twisting and folding of this secondary structure. So further twisting of those alpha helixes and beta sheets um, that are creating a 3D configuration. All right, so they contain disulfide bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrogen bonds, and a critical protein function. So if this tertiary structure is altered, the protein is no longer going to function the way it's meant to. We then have quaternary structure, which is consisting of more than one polypeptide chain. All right, and these are some examples here. If you have any questions regarding this unit of work in terms of nucleic acids and proteins, please leave a comment below and I will answer it. 
Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.